Hi, my name is Sherry Ann Duffy King, and I'm the writer of The Prince in the Mirror. It is the second book in the series from the title of The Crucified Innocents. All right. Now we're going to start off on chapter 28, Mystic Waters. So um, please join us. Let's get started. The Ecuadorian siren lulled heavily against the waves of Flona, the deep ocean that surrounded the planet Eldor. Its waves splayed across the deep wood of the ship, creaking groans let loose as Captain Alphazor lays command upon his crew. His mousy ways made him well-liked and deeply respected from his crewmen. Evie stood in front of the ship, lightly holding strong wood materials from the hull in her grasp. She smiled down at an amazing likeness of the siren below her. She was lifelike and seemed to be familiar. Evie leaned closer over the wood to touch her. Evie's fingers were only a fraction shorter and it only made her reach farther to touch the lifelike creature. She gasps at the pain in her sides as the wood on the ship pressed into her, but she couldn't care less. That creature filled her mind just a little farther. Cool water splayed across her face as she lost balance and slipped, falling toward the creature. The water was coming at her full on. A hand grasped her arm and pulled her up. To her amazement, it was Lusuasi. His almond-shaped eyes sparkling a deep blue Evie had never seen before. My, my, Princess Ariana, never touch that life like siren. For, for it will be the death of you and your kingdom. What? Don't you remember? Evie let go of the suicide and turned back to the front of the hull, holding onto the wood and gazing over the edge toward the creature. Lasusing leaned beside her and shared her linger on the siren. No, I do not remember. Who is she and what is her story? Princess, you swore never to remember or ask for the memories of that siren ever. For as long as eternity has moved, she has stayed. You must never touch her or the reek, or the reek of hell and devastation will come upon all of us. Please try not to worry about her and no more questions on the matter. Just as Lesu Singh was finishing up the rest of his silence, Evie turned to the small island that had started all her adventures. An immense waterfall clung briefly above the island, never touching the tree tips. Two mountains rose on either side of the island, hard rock that smooth to the vines and the smooth to the vines and vegetations. Thick underbrush danced everywhere, and crystal blue waters touched the, the white sparkling sand, rising and falling with every longing. Evie turned around to find all, all of her friends standing behind her next to the suicide. Heat rose to her cheeks as they were expecting a command. She flustered with words in her mind, hoping that they all came out correctly. William Ollivander, will, will the both of you travel to the secret elven sanctuary? Collect support from the elves. Here is the scroll that needs to go to the chief elf, Odwin Winbow. William stepped forward, taking the scroll and placing it in his robes. He smiled and the light from the twin suns glinted off of his blue eyes and pale blonde hair. Ollivander stood with him, smiling, his sharp crescent moon smile. His eyes so black that the reflection of the light seemed to dance and dissolve into him like a black hole of destruction. Evie nodded at them. Turning to the side of the ship, she cast a deep misty wind over the edge to open a portal beneath the ship. Water spread apart at her will. The ship floated above the hole, not collapsing from the gravity pull. Evie smiled as Ollivander and William jumped into the water hole. They all watched as the water closed behind the two. Only the crewmen gasped at, one, at the wonder. The ship, was, the ship came 20 feet from the shoreline, stopping. The wood on the starboard side ripped apart like a, like a shifting puzzle piece, stretching and contorting itself into a thin bridge that pulled to the sand, resting softly as the water grazed it. Evie, Lucy, Lusua, Sing, Iolas, and Aiden crossed the path onto the island of Nori. She, bat she turned back to the Ecuadorian siren, smiling and waving as the ship pulled itself back together and turned to leave. 
Captain Alfie smiled and waved back, his white hair billowing in the wind. And Evie remembered why this man was so familiar. He was the spitting resemblance of Alfie, Ashton's white pet mouse. And she smiled inward to the thought of him crawling up her arm and giving her such a fright. Something glinted, glinting caught her attention. A waterfall embedded in leaves, vines, and um, ju um, jungle brush um, to her right threw deep colors into a small pond that connected to the ocean behind her. She glided to it mesmerized. Deep black tiny jewels dripped fast and frequent. Evie stuck at her palm under the water and caught a few in her palm. The water felt like the water left the trinkets on her skin the sensation started to burn her palms it alarmed her evie threw the jewels away from her but they clung and dug deeper dissolving beneath her flesh ow 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 lucy was beside her examining the wounds she was soon laughing <laughs> evie <laughs> those are jubies they bite like flames and last only seconds when they enter anything they grow when they hit Flona. They are what we eat. I haven't seen them harvested on Nori in a long time. Your father, King Caleb, must have done this for the Nariana submission. Evie took her hand and brushed it across her trousers. The the beaded jewel of or juby popped back out, landing softly on the jungle cord. Evie led the way through the thicket of undergrowth, slicing back greenery. Soon a clearing opened up to the to the spigots of searing meat, an empty village of the small Albert Einsteins that were called Norianas. They passed, barely looking back at the reek of meat and emptiness of their village. Up ahead, Lucy guides Evie and the others to the ancient tree. They pass the hole to the Kuna pyramids headed to the sacred desolate city of Paluma. High dingy walls reached the size of two-story buildings and circled the city like a labyrinth. Evie smiled again. It was sad about this lost civilization, but the thought of David Bowie lifted her spirits. They continued on until they reached a dead end. Lucy pat patted the wall, hard stone, but fragments seemed to scatter off of the surface. Lucy beamed at her most deadly smile. Electricity seemed to dance across her white eyes, showing a deep gray. Then she pushed her back right leg behind her, knocking it dead center of the wall. A groan riveted bass-like. Evie felt the vibration and remembered standing front row to the Marilyn Manson concert, the bass making her feel free and powerful. The wall crumbled, showing a small tunnel. They all followed the tunnel, and it was dark at first, but then opened to a waterfall on the right, cascading over the edge of the cliff. Evie glanced... <laughs> Evie glanced over and noticed that they were back where they had started, only higher. She turned, feeling jaded, and spotted an opening on the other side of the river. A deep, crude staircase led down. They all gathered around their find, sharing a quick glance around. Lucy, Lucy, sing, stay here and guard the entrance. Aiden, Iolas, follow me, please. Darkness swallowed them whole. No mercy for the rich, no less the poor. The deep only holds chaos for all who want to enter. Evie read aloud, the language was crudely set in stone. The door was large and immobile, no other way around this. Evie placed her palm on the stone just beneath the writing. Sheer defeat overwhelmed her. She placed her head on her hand and leaned against it. Chapter 29, Ancient Pathways The door lit up. Bright embers of white pushed forth from the huge runic edges that speckled the dark molding stone door. Vines climbed both sides of the entrance. A huge shadow moved past the opening. Rain began pelting down the stairs behind them. Evie, Iolas, and Aiden glanced at one another. Was it possible that the weather was like in Ballas? Iolas and Aiden shrugged. Evie turned back to the entranceway to the tunnels. What if there is a trap, Evie? A nest. There are always traps. You just gotta know how to deal with them as they come. Evie spoke with her back still turned. She edged closer to the stone, the smell overbearing. 
She raised her hand and placed them on the stone. No, Evie, wait. I was called to her, but it was too late. A creaking echoed around them, bringing small tremors. Iolas and Aiden glanced at each other, anger and worry plastered over their faces. They edged closer to Evie, looking up at the stone by sheer accident. The speckled ruinic etches, etchings were glowing and mobile, shifting around trying to find their accurate place on the door slab. Evie watched, feeling the sheer power beneath her palms and outstretched fingertips. Faint white electricity circled her fingernails, dancing in place. An almost audible melody grated from the crevices of the ruinic etches, etchings. Evie was mesmerized. A puff of citric dust in the stone pulled outward, splitting down the center like an elevator door. The rigid line down the center sent shivers down Evie's spine. Below, a faint blue light greeted them with a chill of putrid air. Winding stone steps with moss climbing the walls and mildewed down the stairs. Another cool draft spilled past as the three entered. The door closed behind them. Aiden pressed his hand against the cool stone. No crack, just a moss wall. Many centuries of neglect and forgotten heritage lay down below. The further they went, the more Evie realized behind the moss was chipped marble, black lines danced across them. The faint light got brighter as they reached the end of the stairs, turning the corner to an immense cavern. The light was coming from a floating marble angel. It was called the Gaia Seraph. Its smoky wings pulled behind in a circular bowl. Blue water shivered the air with light, its halo a smoky gray circle above its head. In its prying hands rests a sword of indescribable beauty. More stairs turned further downward. Evie followed them. Shivers crossed Evie's arms. Evie looked back at the praying Gaia Sarah. The sword pointed downward. Small tinges echoed through the cavern. Beads of light jumped from the Gaia Seraph's smoky halo, coming at Evie, Iolas, and Aiden. They stopped short and started throwing small flaming balls at the three. Aiden and Iolas pulled out their swords, knocking the flames off course. Run! If we cross like Lake Drea, down below, they will be utterly powerless against us. Run! Aiden grabbed Evie and Evie grabbed Iolas, all dodging the flames, running thankful that the doomed thing were lousy shots, missing them. The flames hit against the stone wall, shattering like dust and fire, light lighting up the three steps down the dark stairs. Just below, an immense lava lake with deep specks of blue slithered languidly across their path. Down below, a stone boat made of black marble with leafing moss drenched over the sides, lulling into Lake Drea, waiting for them. They all climbed in. Aiden jumped to the oars and started to pull them into the water. Evie huddled behind Iolas as he used his black sword as a shield and throwing back the flaming dust balls, knocking every few doomed fae out of the air, watching the creatures crumble to the floor, shattering into spurts of dust. They would vacuum back to the Gaia Seraph's halo. <sighs> Sorry, I keep sliding down my chair. Evie looked behind Aiden toward the nearing shore. A row of stout stone dwarfs stood armed, asleep and ready. Their faces looked like gargoyles with dark, gothic, slanted eyes. Evie shivered to the thought of crossing paths with one of those gnarly guards. Lake Drea sloshed against the bottom of the boat. Some of the lava danced upon the molding leaves, making them shiver with rejuvenated life, glowing with neon greens. Soon they all reached the coming shore. Evie turned back to the other side. The doomed bay tried to cross, knocking into a barrier, falling to the ground to shatter and reform to the halo. Aiden stood and helped Evie out of the boat. Iolas followed, sneering to the touch of their hands. Evie crossed over to the dwarfs, waving, waving on and touching them. She concentrated on their faces and their armor, afraid that if she 
should touch them, the consequences could be destructive. Aiden crossed from the boat to join Evie in her curiosity. Iolas grabs Aiden by the arm. The boat recedes to the other side and sinks beneath the sand. Crawling like a child beneath a blanket, it hits a wall, climbing out of the dirt, stretching out and plastering against the wall, glistening, then changing into a 2D painting. Aiden shares a deadly glance with Iolas. How, da how dare you lay your paws on my princess, Iolas spat. I shall do whatever I want. You are not my king, not anymore. Not since you massacred me and bedded my love all in the same room, within minutes of my death. So I could care less what you think, you spoiled bastard. <laughs> Aiden pulled went to pull from Iolas, but Iolas placed himself square between Aiden and Evie. You will do what I say, and killing you and bedding her was orgasmic. Killing makes most monsters hungry for lusty peach-tinted thighs spread and welcome you. The warmth of the cream de la cream. Oh boy, you should have seen her grasp onto me, especially when she realized I wasn't you. She wanted me even more. Sexual fire lit his memory. He smiled coyly. Aiden snarled. You know you were wrong. The sight of you disgusts her. She loves me always and forever, and you will never truly conquer her heart. Iola's smile dropped. <laughs> I see. Someone who rows a boat. Such a chivalry. How charming. You damn coward. You were such a big help. I don't know what she sees in you. Oh, wait. She saw half of me in you. <laughs> now that that is gone, you're nothing but a spineless wench. Nothing compared to the greatness of me, King Iolas Novell. Iolas sneered as Aiden stood, like steaming, still steaming with anger. Iolas looks Aiden up and down, then turns to walk away. <laughs> you see, you're nothing but a yellow peat coward. Aiden gathers himself whispers back, Oh, you'll see. Aiden crosses the path between him and Iolas. With his sword in one hand, he caved the space between them and carved the glowing blue sword, digging into Iolas's sternum. Iolas howled, his mouth covered up briefly with Aiden's free hand. Aiden twisted the metal, cutting deeper while shredding skin. Ribbons of blood and skin seeped down Iolas's legs, crumbling to the dirt floor with a nappy mess. Pain riveted throughout Iolas. Never in his life has he been bested by a bastard peasant. Now you'll see just how safe she is without your existence. She'll finally be able to have a Cyrenic family away from your psychotic world. And then, well, you'll see from the other spirit realms just how wonderful it'll be without you. <laughs> Iolas snapped his eyes back into his scalp, writhing in pain his mouth open and snapping shut while um, between Aiden's thumb and forefinger sealed, sealed on the skin and bone. Aiden's animal form pulled out in shock, his body covered in a splendor of lyc lycanthropy. Black fur sprout across his body, his li eyes lime green with huge dark circles holding the color in place. Aiden yanked out his sword and spun Alice back and watched him fall into Lake Drio. A greedy smile of vengeance pulls his lips up to fulfill, fulfill joy. Evie screamed. Evie screamed no really loud, just so you know. I'm not going to scream no, but that's... Imagine her screaming no! You know? Okay, let's continue on. Because I made it dramatic. There's a lot of yell marks. Aiden growled in deep tenor. He grasped his shoulders, watching the horrid unfold on his love and stood his ground trying to bring her to reason evie he ruined everything look at all he has done to you in his life and countless others he has taken advantage of your innocence taken your virginity and brainwashed you look at all he has made you do against your better judgment he never truly changed he will always be cruel and now we're finally free of him evie pulled back reared her fist and socked Aiden in the jaw. 
Ouch. Never has she ever thought to bring such anger and force to him, but she did. He was stunned. No, we needed him, Aiden. How could you put your selfish ego above all else? Aiden came back to his senses. No, Evie, I would never have killed someone and bedded their soulmate all within minutes of each other. No less in the same room, same bed, with the body lying on the floor. He took that first few moments of bliss from us. Evie pulled her fists back again and threw him threw them up to hit him with another blow to bring him back to his senses. He averted the blow, wrapped his paws around her wrist and holding her for a few seconds. No, Aiden, we needed him. He was to make it all right. Her shrill voice shook the cavern. Aiden steadied a tear, struck Evie, trying to convey his side of things. But now he was seeing his folly decision in his recent actions. Oh. Oh, what did he do? A sound of crinkling armor stopped them short. Yeah. Evie turned her head to the couple of lined dwarfs, their demonic gothic eyes squinting at the chaos on their doorstep. Swords were drawn, most in unison, or one after the other, stretched and yawned, cracking stiff necks. Oh my... Evie said, still held firmly by Aiden. She glanced back at Aiden, his mouth dropped in an immense O. Then she returned her glance back to the stone dwarfs. Who goes there? Their swords were rock spikes with jagged molded ends and they were surrounding Aiden and Evie. Chapter 30, Stone Dwarfs of Glelin. The one who was now calming, now claiming attention, stepped forward, wiping his black locks away from his eyes, from under his stone and metallic hat. Who are you? Evie was stumbling with words. Um, the dwarf spoke again, more stern than before. Who are you and what is your business down here? here below. Evie stumbled for words that didn't seem to come. Aiden looked from the dwarf to Evie, confused. What are they saying? Evie, do you understand the Glorian? Evie glanced back down at the dwarf. My name is Evie. I'm in search of Laura Lai's remains, so I can continue to reunite myself and memories and all. The dwarf shot a glance with huge eyes back at Evie. Come stand by me. Prudent procedures. I cannot let you pass without first initializing the trial. Evie let go of Aiden, prying his fingers from her wrist. He was reluctant to let reluctant reluctant to let her go, but did nonetheless. Evie stood tall. The stone dwarfs were fierce, but humble creatures, so or so she thought from staying in their company for over a few minutes. Happy to not be harmed, the dwarf held her his palms out to say, Stop. Evie was in wonder. Evie, put your hands against mine so I might test you. She pressed her fingers and then her palms against his surprisingly smooth skin and got a shock of electricity and flying images shot through her peripheral vision. Sure vertigo, sure vertigo was making her sick with anger and the loss of so much and destitute of a continual fell. But by, but by the end of the vision, she pictured a white light, Lorelei resting with black and white wings of immense view, pulling out and stretching feathers fell around her as she chatted and then whirl, a swirl of wind, and she was gone. Evie, Evie looked around. The dwarf had done something to her, but she was alone in the clouding dusk of sweet light. Smoke frothed the floor around her ankles. Then, with a swoosh of wind, herself jumped before her eyes. Sheer power overflowed Evie's senses. <laughs> she was staring at herself, like in the mirror, but 3D, with all senses intact. 
emotions revving on without any explanation, Amy moved to see the other, her, move in unison. And at first she did, then she stopped, smiled, and spoke with no emotion, just cool contempt with invincible pride. <sighs> You need to acquire not only Lorelei, but the Blade of Umbala. Evie went to ask, but the other her put a finger to her lips and said, Shh, no. held by Gaia, Sarah. And the image disappeared, and the cavern and Lake Drea came into view. The last were the stone dwarfs becoming more clear by the second, and that passed. Lead me to my body. Chapter 31, Lorelei. Evie learned quickly from the stone door fleeting her that his name was Eldwin. He was stout and serious with a smidge of a gravely accent. If she was on earth, she would have lined as English with a growing rocks crunching together. Aiden turned back to his human form, feeling ashamed. He followed Evie and Eldwin. Many of the other stone dwarfs followed, holding their sword hilts that were attached to their sides. Eldwin turned, stopped abruptly in front of Evie. He turned her, to her and in a chilling accent said, Evie, you must enter alone. No one, not even me, must follow you to her. Evie felt dumbfounded. But with an uneasiness, she squeezed his hand and then left, thankful of the chance to think of what might come next. But even at that chance, she was coming up blank in sort of an unbelievable shock. Like, this was all surreal, a nightmare? That wouldn't end. It wouldn't end, right? It was a nightmare that wouldn't end. Up ahead, twittering creatures circled a tomb slab, open cushions of pearl danced on the vanilla material long curtains of the same material stood shredded with time pieces dancing like paper machete around the bed in the center was a woman her hair white with streaks of red and her face was sunken in but smooth and refreshing at the same time her lashes were long and dark resting on her flesh her hands resting on her stomach, clasped together like a shy little girl, awaiting her first kiss from a neighboring boy whom she adored. Her nails were long, white. She slept like a princess, clean and ready for any given moment. But the moment was now, never later. Evie shook her nerves, stretched her arms, trying to tame the chills and psych herself for the unattainable answers she was due. Evie touched the chill of Lorelei's skin on her hand, then touched her face, still unsure, but ready nonetheless. Evie grabs the pearl material underneath Lorelei's body, pulling it and dragging Lorelei into it like a laundry pool of sheets. Only Lorelei crumbled at that movement. It was freaky, but Evie continued to pursue her goal, pulling the pearl sheet closer together into a ball, dragging Lorelei closer to Evie's chest. She wrapped up Lorelei tight and then pressed Lorelei against Evie's chest. A humming and luminous white light danced from the center of Evie. Then water that had spikes and looked like barbed webbing splayed out and wrapped around the material. Lorelei crumbles not only to dust, ash, and bones, but shatters to ice, sucking Lorelei into Evie. Evie screamed loud. Waves of air protruded out of her mouth. The pain was intensified, and the gene stretching and reconstruction was amazingly unorthodox. Deep below in the sleeping city of Gleeland, Aiden was tense and fighting away past the stone dwarfs to get to Evie. Her scream shook the mighty labyrinth caverns. He burned with sheer panic and worry. Evie, 
Imagine him screaming Evie, alright? Because I'm not going to scream Evie. All twelve stone dwarfs wrestled him and tied him up. As the leader Eldwin calmly stalked over toward Aiden, he grinned, showing shards of rock and molded teeth. Many rows protruding, protruded. The dwarf tried to calm Aiden down, but that gesture only freaked Aiden out even more. Be calm. She's fine. The un unity process is a little painful each time. Aiden gritted his teeth as he screamed more in sonic waves. Each was more shrill than before, but soon a deafening quiet loomed around him, and a shadow stumbled down the staircase. It was Evie, only it wasn't. She was altered. Her eyes were blue, so intensified that Aiden had trouble bringing his eyes from hers. Evie blinked, but images floundered around her insides. Chapter 32, Blade of Embala. Evie stopped, looked over to Aiden and his friends. It was comedic, a bunch of little stone dwarfs holding on to Aiden. His face panicked, but as she got closer, Evie noticed that Aiden was dumbstruck. Eldwin, how do I get the Blade of Embala? The gargoyle's face, the little man pinched his nose and thought, then rubbed his bangs out of his face, smiling briefly. You have to cross back over Lake Drea. Go up the stairs and hope the Gaia Seraph drops it for you. Be wary if the Doom Fae come back when you are done. I need to elaborate to you. Evie shook her head, smiled, then walked back to Lake Drea, trying to get across. Aiden stood beside her. Evie, if the rumors are true about this place and you, you have to use willful power and ask that boat to come and retrieve you. Then tell it to wait. Evie's smile turned back to the edge, and it was a strong tyrant reproach command. Come. But Evie wasn't speaking Cyranic or any of the human languages she picked up so fluently. No, Aiden was sure she was speaking Delorean. It was a sort of magical, like out of the texts of time, where the prophetical night rhymes her, uh, or his mother would read to him. It was the language of the stone dwarfs into all three of the seraphs, be it Gaia, Shadow, or the earthly Nevo, which were the purest, purest of the three. Nevo seraphs rained from the heavens, white smoke, but purer than hope and love. Gaia seraphs are level two pure, more monarch seraphs. Some guard mythic weapons or treasures, and others are summoned to help when needed. Shadow Seraphs are level 3 Monarch Seraphs. They are close to Shadow of Death, but also keep things in order. When wielded by the wrong kind of people, destruction reigns, as if, as if Luau himself raised from the lower depths of Fro himself to maim, kill, and pillage. Each dimension has their hell and Lucifer, and Frau is another word for hell, Hades, and underworld. But either way, destruction will reign. That's why Evie needs all the help she can get, as she thought that a bunch of dirt shifted beneath her, like a traveling snake underground or mole. Then out spiked a boat, black marble like the other in vines. But this boat had wings. Evie crossed Lake Drea, passing the secret barrier that kept the Doom Fang on the side. On this side, dropped. Evie spouted something that sounded like Ooh Pow. The boat leapt from the lava goo, creeping farther up. They flew past the staircase toward the Gaia Sarah. The halo of gray blurred in the distance. Aiden watched as the boat continued onward and watched as the Doom Fae leapt from the halo, flying fast toward Evie. She raised her hat and said, Now, now, Lau. The soaring flames of light burst in specks of them danced to the floor, like what happened sadly after fireworks explode in air. Then, crashes down, to the gravity pool. They closed in on the Gaia Seraph. 
The stone creature of white luminous marble turned its head. The curve of its lips pulled up for a smile, its eyelids closing and opening over its white carved delicate blue eyes. Evie halted the boat and hovered just beneath the Gaia Seraph. The exchange quiet um quiet smiles that the Evie raised her hand, still smiling, said, Drow Gaia Seraph. The supreme being dropped the blade of Imbala, the sharp end of falling fast to the bottom of the cavern. Evie looked up at the Gaia Seraph. Very funny. Then jumped over the edge, sailing toward the sword. Aiden jumped to grabbing her by the ankle. As she snatched the hilt of the sword in her palm, smiling at her luck, Aiden pulled Evie and the sword up into the flying boat. The Gaia Seraph was angry but unable to move. Her halo smoke ring slowly shriveling to a golden ring, and her winged bowl, water bowl, shriveling the liquid the purge, to purge the cavern in darkness. A bright light exploded from the Gaia Seraph. Aiden and Evie commanded the boat to swerve faster than ever back to Gleelun, or so they did, and so they did. With Gaia Seraph on their tail, the winged boat shook as Gaia Seraph ripped the boat wings clean off, sending Aiden and Evie soaring across the lip of Lake Driet. Evie turned, passing the shield, avoiding a swipe from the creature and tossing in her own blow, cutting the Gaia Seraph's stone face in half. Gold blood splayed everywhere. The main amount of blood soaked Evie's clothes. The Gaia Seraph ricocheted off the barrier, crashing to the dirt floor of the cavern like a shattered brick of ice and stone. Slowly disintegrating into white ash, the floor swallowed it whole, then shook out of the dirt rose. A huge tree, gnarly, but with the lush leaves of ivy and smell of citrus. Evie turned back to the direction where they were flying, like a runway sh sled on a steep powdered hill. She pushed up her hands and they slowed to a stop, grinding against the dirt floor. Aiden helped Evie out of the black marble boat. The boat flinched a bunch of times and sunk beneath the dirt, sliding back to a wall, reappearing, then plastering itself to the wall. Wings reattached like spread magnificently. Evie held Aiden's hand as they reached the stone door of Eldwin, whom stood alone waiting. Princess Ariana, you have proven yourself worthy of that sword and our fate. We will assist in your battle. Evie was delighted, but also bewildered. She didn't ask for help. At least not yet. Well, the sentence was sure answer. Sure answered her question and saved some time. The stone dwarf squinched his gargoyle nose again, then touched Evie and Aiden by their hands, teleporting them to the sword and the, them and the sword back to Lucy Lususi. Lucy was delighted to see El see Evie and Aiden, but saddened at the loss of Iolus. She smiled at Eldwin, who smiled back. Hello, Lucy, it's been a long time. Oh yes, it has. Could you do me uh, two more favors, my dear old friend Eldwin? Lucy whispered into his ear. Eldwin smiled and grabbed everyone at the same time, teleporting them down beneath the Kuna Pyramids. Evie smiled at the fond kiss she shared with Iolas down by the exit door in the pyramid. Evie turned to Lucy as Eldwin left. Lucy, if that was one favor, what is the second? Lucy smiled back. Dear Evie, you'll see. Evie shifted her weight from one foot to the other. Okay, Lucy, I need some time to think. I'm going to go be by myself for a minute. 